Welcome to Foresight Friday Roundup, Foresight Health's podcast series for healthcare revolutionaries. Outcomes matter, customers count, and value rules. Hello again, everyone. This is Dave Berta, news editor at Foresight Health. It is Friday, September 9th. Labor Day weekend seems like a year ago already, doesn't it? And the person who stole top-secret nuclear documents from the government still isn't behind bars. Yes, it's been a very busy week. On Friday, September 2nd, while you were probably at the grocery store shopping for your Labor Day barbecue, one medical disclosed that the Federal Trade Commission started an antitrust investigation of its proposed $3.9 billion sale to Amazon. Then, on Monday, September 5th, when you were probably cleaning up after your Labor Day barbecue, CVS Health said it was buying Signify Health for $8 billion. And federal health officials on Tuesday, September 6th, recommended that people get a COVID booster shot every year, just like they do the flu shot. That follows the FDA's August 31st approval of a new COVID booster shot that protects us against the latest variants of the COVID-19 virus. To tell us the significance of these big stories are Dave Johnson, founder and CEO of Foresight Health, and Julie Mertensen, partner at Transformation Capital. But before we say hello to Dave and Julie, I wanted to say hello to the new sponsor of the Foresight Friday Roundup podcast, Infor. By connecting the business and mission sides of healthcare, institutions can enhance staff experience and simplify patient interactions. With data-driven insights and greater operational control, our sponsor, Infor, supports your company in making healthcare a calling again for your staff. Hey, I read the news on my college radio station. Can you tell? That's why I went into print journalism. Hi, Dave. Hi, Julie. How are you guys doing this morning? Dave? The queen is dead. Long live the king. You may remember, Dave, in the introduction to the revolutionary incumbents chapter in the customer revolution in healthcare. I use the example of how a young Queen Elizabeth remade the British monarchy to keep it relevant and sustain its existence when it was being challenged pretty seriously. There was no more hidebound traditionalist and out of step organization than the British monarchy in the 1950s when she came to the throne. If Queen Lizzie, as a very young woman, could respond to existential disruptive threats, surely healthcare incumbents can do the same. Come on, people, let's get it done. So I plan to honor her reign, like most Brits, by going to a local pub and toasting her memory. There you go. I can get on board with that plan. Thanks, Dave. Julie, how are you? Yeah, Charles is going to be no Queen Elizabeth. That is for sure. I am good, but I will tell you I'm experiencing some serious whiplash from the amount of turnover going on among health plan and health system executives today. We are seeing quite a revolving door. Wow. And where did you hear that first? Right here on the roundup a few weeks ago, right? (laughs) Here's where it's at. That's That's right. right. Thanks, Julie. (laughs) Now, before we talk about all these big stories this past week, let's talk about your college journalism experience. Dave, did you work at your college radio station, newspaper, (laughs) or yearbook? If so, what did you do and how did that experience mold you into what you are today? I had several pictures in yearbooks, but never worked on one. Likewise, read the student newspaper, but (laughs) never worked on it. Listened to the college radio station, but never was a DJ. I did play Proteus in Shakespeare's Two Gentlemen of Verona comedy in college, and that turned me into the ridiculous ham I am today. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, The origin story. Thanks, Dave. Julie, how about you? Any college radio, newspaper, or yearbook in your past? If not, did you go on stage like Dave? And uh, how did that shape you into the person you are today? You know, I think the eighth grade yearbook committee fired me, so I'm not so sure that I (laughs) had a high school or a college career in any of those places. But you probably won't be surprised to know that I was very active in planning student events at college. So there's a stream there in my history. Ah, the activist. Huh? That's great. Oh, no. The social planner. Oh, OK. Gotcha. <laughs> okay. I was right there, Dave. Julie, what was the biggest <laughs> rock group you brought to college? That's what I want to know. Oh, that's funny. So we tried really hard to get Tears for Fears. If you remember them, they were my first concert. and That was a big deal. But I think we got like, I don't know, some guy. I don't remember his name. Isn't that terrible? So Bruce old. Springsteen. I'll come back Billy, to you next week with that. <laughs> <laughs> Billy Joel, Elton oh, John. You know, I, that's, that's great. I, I, 
Love. That was a little liberal arts college. We we didn't have those kinds of big names. <laughs> no, that that's great. Thank you. After I flamed out at the college radio station, I joined the newspaper and ended up being the editor a few years later. So I learned a lot of things and uh, some of them about journalism and the rest, as they say, is history. But let's talk about a few stories that broke last week that could make history. The FTC investigation of the Amazon One Medical deal, CVS buying Signify, and the annual COVID booster shot. Dave, I'm going to ask you to put your editor's hat on and tell us which one of those is the biggest story in terms of market impact. Why will it have lasting repercussions for the healthcare market? And how could it affect consumers? Well, let's start with A for the beginning of the alphabet. So I'll go with Amazon. And I don't know whether to laugh or cry about the FTC's announcement that it's investigating Amazon's acquisition of One Medical. It's it's just ludicrous. I may have mentioned this before, but ironically, the day before the big announcement of Amazon's acquisition of One Medical, I finished the book Amazon Unbound by Brad Stone that focused on Amazon's stratospheric growth in the last decade, going from a company with under 150,000 employees and a market cap of $120 billion. I mean, not a small company in 2012, to one today with 1.65 million employees and a market cap of one and a quarter trillion dollars. That's 10x growth for an already large company. Amazing. So the book, Amazon Unbound, is a tightly packed 400-page read, moves along very quickly. Brad's a great writer. It has exactly one paragraph on page 405 on healthcare. You may remember I wrote a commentary titled Amazon in One Medical last month. For those who haven't read it, I can't believe it, but for those who haven't read it, it's an incredibly insightful and riveting piece. Go see for yourself. (laughs) But what got me excited and led me to write the piece is that there's finally a company with the capital savvy technology patients and platform, the one medical platform, which everybody knows Julie and I love, to go toe to toe with the healthcare industrial complex on value based care delivery. Done right as it expands and builds customer loyalty, Amazon One Medical could become an extremely effective channel for determining where and on what terms its members receive specialty and surgical care referrals. As this happens, I expect Amazon and other like-minded companies, you know, think Hinge, to get into the risk business. If that unfolds the way I think it will, incumbents should be afraid, very afraid. Are there reasons to break up Amazon given its size and market presence? Absolutely. Start with AWS. Are there anti-competitive reasons to stop the one medical acquisition? Absolutely not. Just the opposite. We need to break the stranglehold of local and regional primary care monopolies and promote enhanced primary care services that, in turn, promote appropriate treatment, not turbocharged referral and overtreatment. Hey, FTC, are you listening? (laughs) They will later today after we put this on the website, Dave. Julie, any questions for Dave? (laughs) Well, we could talk about that topic forever, but I actually had a question about a different piece of this news this week about these annual booster shots. Here's, I guess, my question. In a world where a major part of our country is now anti-COVID vax, they weren't even necessarily anti-vaxxers before, do you think we'll see people start to fall in line given this alignment with the flu shot timeline? Or, I don't know, how long do you think it's going to take for the anti-COVID vaxxers to quiet down? I love this. I get to do a twofer today. (laughs) Thanks, Jewel. You know, Forrest Gump said, stupid is as stupid does. Uh, By the way, Sally Field was Tom Hanks' mother in Forrest Gump, but also was his girlfriend in an earlier movie called Punchline. That doesn't seem right, but I digress. Back to the vaccines and the boosters. As long as there's political capital in being anti-vax, there will be a slice of the population that puts their political beliefs above their personal health. My guess is their numbers will diminish over time. As you mentioned, Julie, COVID boosters are on their way to becoming as routine as the annual flu shot. Flu shots are voluntary, as will be the COVID booster shots. What exactly is there to protest? I never used to get flu shots, but now I do. And I'll get a COVID booster, too, if I can avoid getting COVID or get it in a less virulent form. I really want to do that. 
my guess is there are a lot more people like me out there being hell smart rather than being anti-vax stupid. But back to the bigger picture, 100% of Moderna's revenues and a huge chunk of Pfizer's are COVID related. So an intriguing question, in addition to the one you asked, Julie, is what Pfizer and especially Moderna will do for encores now that the overbuying government will stop purchasing COVID vaccines and boosters next year. You know, the government overbought because they wanted to guarantee there would be ample supply for everybody. Private markets don't work that way. They won't tolerate anywhere near the same level of redundancy and waste. So that's clearly going to diminish the market. I think the prices will come down, too. So that's going to put pressure on Pfizer and Moderna to do something else. Um, I don't know if they've got a second act. Stay tuned. The only thing I know about Sally Fields is she dated Burt Reynolds at one point. You guys are dating yourselves in almost an embarrassing way. <laughs> okay, <Yeah>. tears for fears. <laughs> Forrest Gump was the 90s. Come on, come on. <laughs> yeah, tears for fears, yeah. Yeah, okay. All right, Julie, I'm going to ask you the same question. Which one of those, FTC, Amazon, CVS, Signify, or annual COVID booster, do you think is the biggest story? You know, why will it have a lasting impact on the market and how could it ultimately affect consumers? For me, it's definitely Signify and CVS, but it's funny. I heard someone say, and I quote, the digital health surprises just keep coming in talking about Amazon One Medical and Signify and CVS and actually a somewhat overshadowed Salesforce launch of remote monitoring. I don't know if you saw that. So this quote, of course, stopped me in my tracks because none of this should be a surprise, right? Given the public market comps and all the talk about home health strategies, certainly afforded by technology. So Business models are taking shape. If you just add on to these announcements, the Walgreens Care Centrics announcement and the United Health Group Walmart announcement, the hits are in fact coming and they're big. By the way, on this Salesforce thing, health systems are expanding into homes, but whether they'll partner with someone like Salesforce to power their remote care, it seems odd to me because I just feel like remote monitoring is a crowded space. And maybe this is the ticket, but Winners are going to have to really demonstrate both clinical and business value. And I'm just, we'll see if Salesforce has it. It's pretty interesting. Anyway, I digress. Signify and CVS, that's the one. And I think it's pretty significant for two reasons. One, a large part of Signify's original solution is a company called Senseo Health, which was arguably one of the best companies in the Health Evolution Partners portfolio. And it was originally designed to facilitate health risk assessments for seniors who were enrolled in MA plans. And this means that Signify really does know risk. They understand it. They understand what the drivers are. They've collected a ton of data around the social environment of people. So it's a very, very powerful origin. Second reason is now their clinical workforce is comfortable making house calls. You know, we're back in the Marcus Welby days, right? And this means they can do a lot more than health risk assessments and other services they may be providing today. So obviously, as we know, this acquisition puts Aetna CVS in the position to vertically manage and provide risk-based care at scale. And, you know, maybe not entirely immediately, but they absolutely now will have the foundation to drive that forward. And of course, at the end of the day, this is really about access, right? Bringing healthcare closer to people where they live. And as one of my favorite people in health and healthcare, Jane Sarasharn Khan said, this is also closer to people's communities who are their trusted touch points that can help advance health equity and decrease disparities in ways that the traditional infrastructure of the medical community can't. So Jane, thank you for reminding us how important that fabric is. Yeah, I remember that original company. So there, there's a real social determinants of health angle there too, going into the home and looking at food security and, you know, housing and infrastructure and things like that. Good insight. Thanks, Julie. Dave, any questions for Julie? Well, before I get to my question for Julie, I'm a little bit curious about this person that was so surprised by this digital health announcement. You know, back when I was using an abacus in graduate school, they taught us that where you stand depends on where you sit. So I'm curious, was this a provider or a payer? What type of person was this that was so surprised by the announcement? Dave, only you would ask that question. It's great. This happens to be a health system consultant. So 
Very yeah. good question. Yeah. I mean, they're sitting in the middle of the about to be yeah. run over yeah. industry. Yeah. The avalanche is falling and they're still square dancing down on the mountain. Um, yeah. It's just, just incredible. Anyway, home is where the health is. Julian, you covered that really well. So here's my question. The CVS Signify and the other transaction you mentioned bring small armies of pharmacists, nurses, and nurse practitioners into the competition for the ever mighty healthcare dollar. Meanwhile, the AMA, among others, is aggressively pursuing legislation in almost every state capital to put the genie back in the bottle. They call it scope of practice creep. So they want to limit the ability of pharmacists, nurses, and nurse practitioners to do more. We know the right answer is getting all healthcare professionals to practice at the top of their license. But who ultimately wins this titanic battle, market or medicine? (laughs) So little history. I can remember sitting around the table at Health Evolution Partners talking about Senseo Health when the CMS letter, you know, the infamous CMS letter that comes out and can literally change the course of the future of companies or practice with the stroke of a pen. And the big concern in the CMS letter was where appropriate care could be provided. Would the home be a place where care could be provided or would it still be defined as being in a physician's office only? or, you know, other relevant medical infrastructure. And Senseo lived to fight another day when that CMS letter came out. So back in the day was when you'd be really worried about the market coming in and taking over. I mean, frankly, in the way we've seen pharma, right? I think today with the power of these retail players and the demonstration of business models, we're in a very different landscape now. And I can imagine that there will be a longer battle here between the interests of the AMA around maybe certain things that can be done in the home. But look, we're looking, we're moving to hospital in the home. So I just don't think they're going to have the staying power. Thanks, Julie. I'll put my money on the FTC looking into the Amazon One medical deal. Can you use your market power in one industry to artificially manipulate prices in another industry? It's like a vertical integration death match. So I love it. Now let's briefly talk about other news this week. Julie, what other news happened this week that's worth noting? Well, among all the revolving doors and health systems and health plans, my favorite one this week is a fantastic, talented, incredible executive named Sarah Islin, who is currently the COO of Blue Shield, who has just taken over Andrew Dreyfus's spot as the CEO of Blue Cross Blue Shield Massachusetts. She doesn't start until January, but Dreyfus has been in this role for a long, long time. Sarah is an executive who has run both government and commercial business and been inside the government. And I can't wait to watch her work. Yeah, well, we'll keep an eye on that. Thank you, Julie. Dave, any other news that made your front page? Yeah, we need to shake up these blues, right? So there are a lot of women leaders going into these roles. So I, Julie, thanks for bringing that to our attention. Let's stay on top of that one, Dave. You got it. Speaking of strong women, I'm going to go back to the queen. I think she is the textbook example of leading a long, healthy life, eating well, getting exercise, and so on. Probably helps to be queen. But she actually met with the new British prime minister this week, also a woman, and then basically died the next day. We call that compressed mortality, you know, live long and die fast. So I think she's an example of what the future of human health span can be like, you know, a long, productive, happy life, and then a quick death at a very old age. Again, let's toast the queen. Got it. Thanks, Dave. And we did find out, Dave, you're quite the thespian. And Julie, you're a rocker, right? (laughs) Thanks, Dave. And thanks again, Julie. And thanks again to our sponsor, Infor. Infor connects the business and mission sides of healthcare, enhancing the staff experience and simplifying patient interactions with data-driven insights and greater operational control. And that's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to learn more about the topics we discussed on today's show, please visit our website at foresighthealth.com. And don't forget to tell a friend about Foresight Friday Roundup. Subscribe now and don't miss another segment of the best 20 minutes in healthcare. Thanks for listening. I'm Dave Berta for Foresight Health.